Hello and welcome back to another episode of Fully Books, the Hidden Gems author podcast, which Craig Touch and myself, Roland Hume, chat some of the interesting figures and leading lights of this crazy industry we're in of writing and self-publishing. And I think today's guest really is one of the leading lights and the experts in self-publishing. It is Dale L. Roberts, indie author, podcaster, self-publishing expert, and the latest guest we have on our podcast. Dale, we are delighted for you to join us today. How are you doing? I'm I'm pretty jazzed up. I told you guys before we even hit the record that just knowing that Hidden Gems Books actually has a podcast was blowing my freaking mind because I've been talking about you guys for a while now. I discovered you over on the Kindlepreneurs podcast. You remember when that was still around? Yeah. yeah, I, yeah. Oh, I love your energy. You're bringing a lot of energy. I didn't, this. I didn't even realize that wasn't around anymore. He, uh, I, it's, I think he just stopped doing it uh, because Dave has like fifty thousand other things he's doing yeah. with like Atticus, Publisher Rocket, Kindlepreneur.com, and Lord knows every other business he has going on as well. The man is insane. I, I try to yeah. keep up with him. And by the way, Rollin, thank you so much. Flattery will get you everywhere with me. Yes, the energy always goes <laughs> up by ten x as soon as you hit that record. Oh well, yeah. yeah I mean, you know, I mean, for me. It's four o'clock in the afternoon. Normally my energy is going down, but I'm like, oh yeah, let's get this done. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, we're we're super excited. And now I'm because I've been I've been a uh, a fan of yours. I watch your YouTube videos all the time. Um, so I've often thought I should reach out and ask you to be on there, but I thought, you know what, he's too big of a star. He would he would never come on much. <laughs> <laughs> and then and then you reached out, so it was perfect. It was rather fortuitous. Uh, I, I honestly was just blown. You know, when I did reach out to you guys, I didn't put, I didn't correlate between Hidden Gems books and this podcast. So again, that's why I was super, super pumped. But I can't wait for us to dig into some of this content that we were kind of discussing before we uh, hit the record. For sure. So what we want to do today is, um, well, first of all, let's talk a bit about, you know, you and, and how you got yeah. started. But what we want to do is sort of talk about some of the biggest uh, issues going on right now in the publishing world. You know, Roland and I sometimes get together and talk about that on an, on an episode, but I think it'd be way more fun having you involved and you seem to always know some of the, like the hottest things that are happening. So I I really look forward to that. So let's let's start it off by um, hearing about you and your, your YouTube channel that, um, you know, people aren't familiar, uh, you know, it's about self-publishing and you have lots and lots of subscribers. Uh, you know, we can definitely learn something from that. Uh, but, you know, tell us how you got started with all of this. Uh, you know, I got into the business. It's It's been over a decade that I left my day job. I used to work as an activities director and uh, upon a challenge from my corporate wellness coach, it was like, hey, you should write a book about health and wellness because I, I, I love exercise and fitness and such. So I ended up doing that. And when I self-published it, I sold a few and I'm like, hey, hey, if I can do this full time, I should be able to make some money. Now, mind you, uh, two years into it, I discovered that it was not as easy as I thought it would be. But thankfully, I got that breakthrough success. And it led me to forming a YouTube channel, which was called Self Publishing with Dale at the time. Now I've got two channels, which is the Dale L. Roberts channel, which is the large one that everybody sees the one's close to 100,000 subscribers. And then the Self Publishing with Dale podcast, which is a little bit more rough around the edges. It's a lot more just speaking off the cuff and not so produced as what the other videos are. And uh, I have really loved it. I initially got into YouTube just to kind of help answer some questions. Little did I know that I would become so hooked that I equally love it as much as writing and publishing books. You know, writing and publishing videos, so much fun. Uh, I just recommend any authors that are like thinking, mm, should I get into YouTube? Yes, but be careful because it's a slippery slope because as soon as you start going into video, that means you're having to spin a couple more plates and get things going. But no complaints. I really love uh, doing what I do. And yeah, that's... That's really it in a nutshell. Hopefully that, that leaves a little bit of time for us to talk after. <laughs> you get a lot of instant gratification with the YouTube, don't you? You post your video and people start leaving comments and likes like immediately. Whereas a book, of course, you've got to spend three months writing it and then publish it and stuff. And so there's a lot of delayed gratification. Yeah, you nailed it for sure. For sure. Absolutely. Because I can just put that video out and I'll see the metrics kind of jumping up. There are people watching it. I can see how long they're watching it. I can see who's subscribing, who's unsubscribing, who's liking, disliking, all that stuff behind the scenes. Whereas you put out a book, 
the only way for you to measure how well it's performing is through cold hard sales and reviews and that is gosh it's tough so yes the youtube thing kind of balances out my ego just a little bit you know with <laughs> the fact that i get like really bummed if i'm not selling enough copies of a book yeah i i mean you have a lot of subscribers and that's where sort of that really i think it gets it all rolling right like we're we're a pretty and it doesn't surprise me that you hadn't heard that we had a podcast because we you know i'm i'm not the i'm not the social media guru that uh, that you are and i am uh, <laughs> you know i send it out to my own list of authors but i i don't do very much else in terms of promoting it which is something that i really need to work on but um yeah. but luckily you know you you found us so we can we can talk to you about all that stuff and maybe that's what i'll have to do is pick your brain on on how to get this uh, better promoted but um for now let's talk about what's going on in the publishing world so what are some of the you know the big stories these days that authors need to know about Ooh, man that's 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 a loaded question i know i sent you a list of some potential uh things but one of the things that just rolled out over the past few days was the draft to digital survey that they did on artificial intelligence and it was very very insightful because they'd sent out this survey i think it was a few weeks ago to all of their account holders just to kind of see where authors stand with selling rights for training artificial intelligence and the uh the results weren't surprising at all uh because i hear it on a very regular basis from a lot of my viewers in fact there's been even some viewers that since i have a pro ai stance that are like i'm disappointed in you dale unsubscribe dislike and you know it's okay i'm not here trying to convince anybody that they need to get on the artificial bandwagon artificial intelligence bandwagon uh, i i like it i find many good uses for it did you get a chance to look over that draft of digital survey at all yeah, I did. Yeah, I was quite I mean, interested. Yeah, and I mean, I mean, it's pretty in depth. But like you said, I am not at all surprised either. I also hear from authors all the time that are um, not happy with the whole AI, the way it's working, the way it's rolling out, the way people are using it, the way it was trained, all that stuff. And yeah. you know, you have to be careful about what you say because yeah, like you know, I totally agree. People get angry uh, about if if your opinion is is sort of more pro ai than they'd like to hear but i think yeah that has that has shifted since it started you know it hasn't been around that long i yeah. mean AI has but not this level the chat gpt right. you know rush that started it all has been i don't know it's less than two years i think right and uh and when i first started talking about it back then everybody was angry about it uh and now i'm starting to hear you know less anger more you know, questions, more people being thoughtful about it. They they see that there's more to it. It's not about writing for you and, and it sh and it shouldn't be, and it's not able to anyways. I would never use it to write a book for me or to write an article for me, but it can be used for a lot of really, really good, useful things. Mm -hmm. And one of the things for me is brainstorming. I love using it for brainstorming. Oh, yeah. Um, and uh you know so but but the the, the survey that uh draft digital did it was talking about sort of uh the training aspect of it and and whether or not people would i guess give up their right uh, not their rights but their their work to allow it to be used for training if they were if they were going to be compensated for it, if not right so i think that was the gist of it right yeah yeah essentially they were like hey if we could find a way to monetize this would this be okay uh it was it was pretty f uh, funny actually this is something that i haven't shared publicly so i think it's perfect time for us to go ahead and share it here on this podcast that um drafted digital I'm, I'm in constant communication with their team they're fantastic over there and they've given me a warning that the survey was going out and then i have a lot of feelers out in various communities whether it be on facebook or discord and beyond and there were a lot of people that were approaching me like oh my gosh draft the digital's getting dragged through the mud just for asking questions this is how hotly debated it, it, it was and is. And it was funny because they weren't saying, we're going to do this. They were saying, if this were a scenario, would you be interested in something like this? And lo and behold, this survey comes out and Chris Austin, the CEO of Draft the Digital, 
kind of frames it a little bit better. He's like, hey, I totally understand. We just want to make sure that you guys have options available to you. And if you would like to consider something like that, then we'd make it available. But apparently, as you guys could see by the results, it was not highly favored at all. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I hate that you can't ask a question and uh, without people getting angry. Like, that's yep. the way we learn. That's how, that's how we figure things out. That's how we create new products. Like, you know, just because someone's asking the question, it, don't be mad about that. Give your answer. You know, yep. if the answer is no, then it's no. And, and if he, they hear no from enough people, then they just won't do it. You know, it, but yeah. that's this kind of thing is out there. AI is out there. You can turn your eye, you can turn a blind eye towards it, but it's not going away. And and I don't personally think even with all the lawsuits that are out there, it's still not going to go away. There's no way. There's too much money involved right now. Yep. There is absolutely no way that this is going away. So you need to figure out how to work with it instead of against it and and make it work for you so and and sure it doesn't mean you have to sell your rights and i don't even know if that's really going to become how it works it might you know it might become like a spotify model right where everybody sort of like contributes their stuff but it's i mean at the same time like i just i don't even see how that's possible and even when they you know even if they did something where they were paying everybody who contributed that's for that one model that that people are using, right? What about all the others that are out there? And and then there you can you can download models that are already trained and have them on your computer. Nobody controls those. So even if there was laws against it, man, they're still there, right? There it's already done, and that's not excusing that behavior. It's just no. it's a reality, right? So people shouldn't be mad because we're saying those things exist now and and you know, deal with it. But they do, right? And we have to. We have to deal. We have to figure out a way. To, to get past this issue um, and 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 figure out how it'll it'll fit in our lives and our and our work and help us right and I think you know using it to to brainstorm you know brainstorming is like those that thing where you basically you know it's like more minds are better than than one right and you know everybody's yeah. got their different experiences and and you know if i if i sit in a room and i and i talk to you two and we and we're all brainstorming about a certain idea you guys have came from a different background you have different experiences you have different life views you're going to have different ideas right so the three of us can come up with a whole bunch of different ideas than i can come up with my own when you brainstorm with the eye it's like you're brainstorming with the whole world right like it's got yeah. every idea <laughs> it's, it's almost too much sometimes but it just allows you to think outside the box that you're usually in right everybody's in their own box their own head and when you when you brainstorm with ai it doesn't mean you have to use the ideas that it come that it comes up with but it comes up with different ideas that push you in a different direction than you were you were you know laser focused on i'm i'm thinking a and then it talks about b and then i think oh yeah b exists and that's a thing and then i come up with c because of that you know so i, I think there's lots of ways we can use it and it doesn't have to be about writing for us or replacing writers yeah for I'm sure well, i'm curious on what you two would think about uh is there ever a price that you would contribute to your work to training large language models uh, is there a price? Could it be a million dollars? Could it be $2 million? Is it $100,000 or is it even $2? I was really interested in that part of the survey. Um, okay. And I know they asked, like, if it was used in non-competitive ways. I mean, I, you know, if I've written a bunch of novels, I wouldn't necessarily be opposed to them being used as training as long as I still, you know, had the rights to publish the novels and them to be out there in mine. And I think that was... Okay. That was the question. And I think a lot of people are upset about um, the thought of these AI companies scraping their stuff and using it without their permission. But at the same time, if you get to be like, hey, I will volunteer and get paid to give my stuff over to you so you can use it to train a model that will not impact me directly. It's not like it's going to be, you know, taking my books off the shelves and hopefully it might be making something bigger in the future. Yeah. What, what do you think about that then, Craig? Would you, is there a dollar amount that you would end up contributing your works to train LLMs? I personally, and I'm probably the, you know, the minority, but I'm not bothered by it at all. Um, I don't even, you know, it's not, I don't need a price. Like, I mean, sure, if they're paying, if they're giving out money, I'll take some. But like, honestly, yeah. <laughs> we'll get in that line. <laughs> yeah. Where are the cookies at? <laughs> <over there? laughs> 
I really have no problem with it. And maybe it's because I understand how it works more than the average person. Maybe I, maybe I don't understand how it works, <laughs> you know, but, but to me, it's like, all it's doing is using it as a training model. The reason why we can ask questions and it can understand what we're asking is because it's used so much data as training and we wouldn't have this wonderful tool, forget about it being used for writing and whatever. We wouldn't have this tool if we didn't have the internet and all of this freely available uh, information already out there that that it was able to, to pull from to build this intelligence. And it's not, you know, I'm I'm kind of a, it's it's the way I think of with piracy, right? Piracy is always that big concern with authors, and oh, obviously gosh, yeah. nobody wants their book to be pirated. But what I always tell authors, and you know, I personally believe this, whether or not others do or not, I believe that most of the people that are pirating books are not buying books. They're they're in one camp or the other. And yep. when when so your your book is being pirated by people, they weren't gonna buy it anyways. Most of those people, you're not losing sales. If anything, it's helping you. It's getting spreading the word of your name that probably wasn't out there. The, the, me, sure, it, it might hurt bigger names that are already known, right? But like yeah. self publishers, it's just giving you free exposure to people that you know that were not gonna find you or buy you probably anyways. And listen, maybe they'll like you, and then they'll be like, "Hey, I want to support this person." They'll buy future books from, of yours on on Amazon or or wherever else. So it's the piracy issue has never bothered me. I never think, "Oh, if my book got pirated a thousand times, I lost a thousand sales." No, I didn't probably lose any sales. <laughs> maybe, I, or or if I did, a small fraction of that. Um, so that sort of thing, like because I have that mindset, it's like you know, if my books were out there anyways free and the, where they can look through them and, and from what I understand most of these models they're not really they're not using people's books unless those books were available free they weren't going on Amazon and buying everyone's book and then reading it right they were using stuff that is out there in the public domain yeah um, and so it was out there and so the AI read it just as anyone else could have read it and learned from it you know, people learn from, you know, artists you know, say, oh, I, I was influenced by Michelangelo. I studied all of his works and then I became a painter or whatever. It's like, and that's all the AI is doing. <laughs> it's studying all I, your work. That's a, learning from it. that's a really good point. I think if you look up like cognitive science, you realize that we as human beings, our brains and the way we write is a language model that we have we have created for ourselves based on reading things. I write my novels and they are heavily influenced by Ian Fleming, Leslie Charteris, Jilly Cooper and Fiona Walker and like those four authors. All, a lot of what they produced have helped mold m what my writing is. So I'm almost a model of them. And like, just because it's in a computer, it doesn't really differentiate it that much from how we as human beings develop our own language models. Yeah. Oh my gosh. That's so, you nail it right on the head on that one. It's, we're all kind of artificial intelligence to a certain extent. We all have our unique filters and the way that we communicate with the world is going to be so much different than actual artificial intelligence. And this is why I am, I've never been fearful of AI replacing me because what I bring to this world is so truly unique that no artificial intelligence is going to be able to duplicate that. And when it can, I'm already shifted. I've already improved. I've already become a better writer, a better human being. So therefore, the content that I'm putting out is going to be much stronger. To me, I think the best way to leverage artificial intelligence is a human intervention. You have to go in there and put your thumbprints on that, your fingerprints all over it and get some type of DNA involved. So that way it actually is working in your favor. Because ultimately at the end of the day, whether you're writing a book yourself or you're having assistance with AI or you're having AI completely generate that, the end user is going to be the reader. We all are reaching readers at this day. And, and if that reader is satisfied and happy with that product you're putting out, does it really matter where it's coming from? And I, I'm just, this is rhetorical. You guys don't have to answer that by any stretch, but think about that. We're all reaching readers. If that re reader is happy, then who are we to argue? And this is where I, I think I, there was like a switch over the last year or so where I started reading some AI written books that 
was that had human intervention. They went in, they changed it up, they did some editing, they did some full proofreading, and it read good. And I was like, I enjoyed this. I was like, I don't see any problem with it. I'm if I'm enjoying this book and I've paid good money to it and I've paid some time into it and I liked it, then what's the harm? And to me, I think it's just we're in this really interesting day and age. And I'm sure we're going to look back a decade from now and some folks are going to go, man, either they're going to go, that wasn't such a big deal or could be that extreme of like, well, here comes Terminator. It's, <laughs> it's yeah. Skynet's going to take over any day now. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think that people are more worried, not necessarily in, in the, from that perspective of, um, you know, if they were able to use it to, to create a better book, they're worried that eventually it will create its own books and then put them out of work because it would be able to churn out, yeah. uh, you know, a million, you know, millions of books. And if they're of quality, then they're, you know, they're out of a job. Right. And that, and that's what a lot of industries are facing, not just writing, right. Everybody oh, yeah. who can, the AI is replacing, uh, and that's, that's a very real fear. Um, but I also, I don't know that AI will get there. You know, the one thing that I, without human intervention, I think it still lacks creativity. And it, it, you know, whenever I've used it, it's, it's very, a lot of the ideas that come up, comes up with are very, um, you know, they're, it's, it's clear that these are not unique ideas. And so that's why you have to sort of guide it to get it to, to what you want. And that uniqueness and that creativity is coming from your brain. And then you use it sort of to help you know, as a tool, you know, it's a, it should be used as a tool. And I don't know if we'll ever get to the point where it's writing books and competing with regular authors, but I think that is the core of the fear that authors have. And maybe it's, you know, it's not there yet. I still don't think, but, but, it, you know, it might get there. It might not. I don't know. It, it, like a lot of people say, it's not true. Um, Art of, uh, it's not true AGI, you know, artificial general intelligence, where it's like basically thinking as a human or whatever. But, but, um, and I think it would have to be at that level. And I don't know that we'll get there in our lifetime. But then again, I never thought we would get to where we are right now in my lifetime. So, right, right. That, was, that felt like it was overnight. So, <laughs> you know, I woke up one night and, and at one morning and I, and I read an article about ChatGPT and I'm like, what's this? And I'm like, wow, we now have artificial intelligence. So it's like, you know. Zero sixty. I've seen it and there's boiling in the background with uh Joanna Penn. She has a fantastic podcast, The Creative Pen, yeah. and Michael Laron of Author Level Up. The two of them were the first to kind of introduce me to the idea of artificial intelligence. And I, I was like, what are they talking about? What is this all about? And next thing I know, it started coming out. So they they really had signaled that warning shot to authors, like, hey, this is coming. And I remember thinking like, this can't be anytime soon, but I'm like you, Craig, where I was like, where the heck did this come from? It just, two years ago, it's just everywhere. Everyone and their mother's doing it. And they're like, hey, you can go ahead and write your next book in the next 12 minutes. And I'm like, what? <laughs> I think people underestimate as well how heavily industries are investing in this. I mean, I work uh, on the side in the legal profession and law firms are investing billions of dollars in it because you can sit you can say like we are going to trial for this can you write a brief and it can do a lot of the basic groundwork however it also needs that human eyes i mean there was a, a guy a lawyer who lost his license his uh he got kicked he lost his application to the bar because he got chat gpt to write a court case he went to court he presented it to the judge and the judge was like all these cases that you have listed here none of them exist and he was like, oh, and ChatGPT had hallucinated them. <laughs> and so it was a well, I think what artificial intelligence does is it can structure things beautifully because it sees again and again through its language models. This is how well structured things are, but it doesn't know the details. And I tried it once writing an article. Sometimes I write articles about what can you learn from other other authors? And just for fun, I put in a fairly recent author, brilliant thriller author called Frida McFadden. And I said, what can you learn from Frida McFadden? And ChatGPT didn't know who she was, but it still wrote an article and was like, hey, Frida McFadden writes these wonderful children's books about talking animals. And I'm like, no, she doesn't. She writes like these really twisty psychological thrillers about like yeah. devious women. And it was just it's so interesting that there are some aspects that it does really well and I can see why companies are investing and yet also it's tripping balls all the time.
Yeah, it's it, it, if you guys are, are using artificial intelligence, not just you two here, but anybody that's listening or watching this here, uh, absolutely cross check. If you're using it for facts, you need to cross check those references and make sure that any of those resources and references are actually reliable because there's often times that they're going to give you some misinformation because the LLMs were trained on everything. That means yep. the facts and the misinformation all together. So you do have to kind of go through that alphabet soup, make some sense of it and make sure that this is going to, you know, align with what you're putting out there. Oh my gosh, can you imagine getting disbarred because you were <laughs> foolish enough to go ahead and get Jack GPT to do your work for you? Don't, don't do that. I mean, you should have at least paid a, a, a legal uh, assistant or whatever to fact Get a paralegal, right? yeah. Just a paralegal, <laughs> yeah. Look up all the all those cases, make sure that they're real. I think, you know, the, the industries that have more to worry about with AI is it's sort of like more like from my perspective is like coding, right? It can write code oh, and yeah. code it doesn't it doesn't need to be creative you you provide the creativity you say okay i want a program that does this and it can do it and i've used it i've said like even just for fun i've been like hey create a create the game snake you know and and i explain what the game is and, and put it in it, create like an html page where i can play it and it does and then i just pop it in my browser and i can play it like it and then i can tweak it i can do all sorts of stuff like it is pretty Good. And from what I've heard, like a lot of big companies are starting to use it for that. They're training it on their own sort of data sets and uh, their own code with in-house LLMs because they're worried about, you know, trade secrets getting out or whatever. But I think that's more of an area because it's less creative and more fact based, you know, it's logic basis, you know, it, you know, this, this is how you, how you do stuff is all sort of like pretty much already figured out. Um, and then it's just a matter of, you know, all the, you know, the, the, uh, the algorithms are all sort of out there and, and people use all the same sort of algorithms for sorting for this is for that's right. So it's, it's much easier for, um, for AI as it is now to, to take away the coding jobs than it will be to take away the writing jobs. So, you know, but that's a good I think one. I mean, some writing you know, jobs, like copyright. Yeah, I mean, some some of it. It's it, I'm sure there's lots of people using it right now. I, you know, it, so that's another thing. You know, somebody here's what's your take on this? I have a feeling of, of uh, how, why this is done, and I've sort of like um, I've mentioned it a few times, but I want to see if if you agree, and and I, I won't even say what my feeling is until I hear from you, so I don't uh, spoil your opinion. So when Amazon, when you upload your book to Amazon on KDP, they ask that question: Did you? Um, are any parts of your text uh, generated by AI? Um, why is it that you think that they asked that question? I actually spoke directly to the KDP team on this one. Actually, okay. it's, it's for uh, data analysis. They're just collecting yeah. information. And um, they that's all they would say. They're say they said, we're just collecting the information. Say, yeah. Right, right. And they're usually pretty straightforward. They, they Every now and then when I ask a question that they can't answer, they'll go, we can't comment. That specific one, they're like, we're just collecting data. Now, what are they collecting the data for? Well, remains to be seen, but we can already see over on Amazon's marketplace how they're leveraging artificial intelligence. You look into the reviews, they have summaries and synopsis of there. Yeah. Um, they even have like a new tool when you go into the app, I'm forgetting like Fredo or something like that. It's called, it's a real like random thing. And you can type out what you're looking for as opposed to using the search engine and hope that you can kind of find the product. It'll match you up with the product based on what their artificial intelligence has done. I'm wondering that by disclosing that it's artificial intelligence, if they're not taking the stuff that wasn't generated by artificial intelligence and using it to train their models in the background. That, that's like 10, 10 foil hat conspiracy theory here, folks. This is not mm. facts, but I'm just wondering if they're not taking the, like they're trying to dismiss anything that was done by AI so they can find the human stuff. Now, that would be super like bad Especially. if they were <laughs> yeah, no. doing that um I, I don't think that's what they're doing okay let me tell you why i think they're doing it i think it's a i think it's a much more sort of like fiscal <laughs> fiscal reason in terms of uh hedging their bets so all those court cases that are that are running through the courts and they'll probably take years to get resolved where you know everybody's suing to say that uh you know they're that ai is ripping authors off and they shouldn't be doing it in this we don't know how they're gonna turn out yeah. If worst case scenario, and I, I don't think that 
this is going to happen, but it's possible. Worst case scenario, the courts just come down hard. And they say, no, you cannot run these. You cannot generate these things. You can't use people's stuff without permission. Everything that's created by it is illegal, right? Amazon now has to, they're going to be, the only one going to be on Amazon to pull everything that's used, uh, that's been used to, uh, has used AI to be, to create product. They're, the courts are going to say, you have to pull it from your shelves. And they're going to say, how the hell would we do that? Well, there's one good way they can do it is everybody who's disclosed it, they push a button and those yeah. all disappear. It's like an <laughs> right? escape hatch. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that, I think that that's the real reason why they've done that because this is a potential coming down the line. I mean, they could be using it for other things. I'm sure they are using yeah. it for data analysis, whatever. But I think that this is a, um, you know, a, that's something that they're putting very much in place because of, if the tides change and they have to identify quickly which books have used AI, now they have a flag, <laughs> you know. And I don't know. That's my feeling. But again, not based I, on facts. I, but I think that is definitely a good theory. And I think there was a lot of people when this had initially rolled out. Uh, what was it, earlier this year? Gosh, everything blends together for me. Uh, when they had announced the whole AI disclosure thing, there were a lot of people that were like, I'm not going to disclose it because I feel like it entraps me. And I was just like, okay, well, you do your business the way that you want to. But to me, I would rather just be honest and have my account shut down than to be dishonest and have it shut down and feel like a complete you know, jerk. So yeah, yeah it's, and, and you know, it's so funny because with the whole AI, disclosure i think some people unfortunately don't understand that like kdp has come out and saying like they essentially said there's a difference between generative ai and assistive ai so if you're using pro writing aid or grammarly that has artificial intelligence built into it they're not concerned about things like that what they're concerned about is is the content being put together entirely by ai are your graphics being done by ai we want to disclose that so that way we know where we're at and, and like i think right. that's a good theory where it could be an escape hatch where they're like stuff goes south they can go well but what about those other ones that decided not to disclose right are they going to fly can, under the radar <laughs> well they they now have plausible deniability in the sense that they can say well listen we did our best like what can we do like and and honestly there's all True. those tools but i very much think that those tools just don't work you know that that the tools that that supposedly tell you if something's generated from uh, was written by ai or not i mean yeah. You know, they're basing it on keywords to say, you know, the only way it would work is if everything that was generated from AI was kept in a database and then it could search through it. It's not done that way. And yeah. so they're just basically looking at it to try to determine word patterns and 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 this and that's right. It's very easy to change that. You change a few words um, that you know. There's websites that tell you what the most common words are used by AI. AI. You can change a few of those words. Uh, and and they, they give false positives all the time. There's all sorts of stories about, you know, certain like big name books that were written long before this they, that AI says, oh, very much uh, written by AI, you know. Uh, so like you can't really use those tools. And that's why, you know, from the perspective of being honest, absolutely you should be honest. But from the other side of it, even if you're not, I don't think there's any way that they could ever definitively tell if something was written by AI if you have not admitted it. They can certainly uh, accuse you of it, but I don't think they can prove it at all, right? So I still think you should be honest because you you know you don't want to take the chance of you know Amazon's wrath coming down on you or or anything yeah. else. But um, but the reality is like. And that's why I, I don't think it, it you know the, the the button thing you know being able to shut it all down will be able they'll be able to say look we did as much as we could but I mean for everybody who, who didn't say it I, there's no way for them to detect it and yeah. so true yeah I think there there was so many people out there speculating that would be some type of like a digital watermark for people that were using it but like if you're nuking the document before it is even uploaded meaning that you're removing any of those behind the scenes type things there's no way for anybody to really know other than just let me accuse you of this well maybe i am a stilted writer maybe i do use a lot of flowery prose easy for me to say but you know <laughs> at, at the end of the day yeah it's it's and and also I, I think it all comes down to that customer experience uh i've noticed within the last few months i've gotten a lot of uh viewers that have commented on some of my videos lately and some have reached out to me via email and even on my discord that there has been a new thing that KDP has been doing and that they are blocking books due to a perceived poor customer experience. They don't want to have a poor customer experience. Now this is, 
they're just uploading these books. They're not even fully published onto the marketplace. It's like KDP is now playing gatekeeper to the actual stuff that's going on there. Now, I haven't asked some of these folks if they're using artificial intelligence or maybe they need to use artificial intelligence. Maybe their writing's that bad, but it seems like there's a lot more of these happening lately. And again, this is kind of anecdotal. I couldn't be able to point to one case or the other, but I've seen enough over the past few months where a lot of books are getting blocked lately for a perceived poor customer experience. They're like, we want to make sure that this is the best customer experience possible. And we don't think this reflects our values. And I'm like, oh goodness wow so we're, we're starting to go into a new realm here because previously self-publishing had no gatekeepers now we're starting to get gatekeepers in there and thankfully we've got options and we have alternatives out there so if for some reason kdp blocks your book folks guess what kdp is not the only game in town and you can still get onto amazon without having to use them so you're saying that there when the when the author uploads the book to kdp right at that point it says poor quality? it's it's happening in the approval process. So in oh, other words, okay. they've so gone through. Done it on you, okay, but it hasn't yeah. right, okay. they've done all three of the steps. They've uploaded. They're right. waiting for the approval, and then they get this rejection email, pretty much telling them they they blocked. Now, if any time that you get a book blocked inside your KDP account, it's going to have this red all caps blocked on your title and it will be there forever it's like the freaking red letter you're gonna have to carry it everywhere with you i ran to that problem when i first broke into the business because i was just i was just shotgun approach i was just publishing everything and anything and i'd done a fairly risque cover for an erotica book and yeah that got blocked and that was when that, i literally like i, I was like <clears throat> I, I was shocked I was like, this is totally clean. I get a hold of them and they're like, unfortunately, this is too risque. This is not an according to our, our content guidelines. I haven't had that issue since, but I can only imagine there was somebody who said that they had uploaded 12 books and got all of them blocked. They're like, I've been trying to change things out. And I'm like, did you get a hold of customer support? Because you're going to want to make sure you talk to customer support before you publish anything else, because there's something wrong. You are uploading something that they don't like and they've had enough. Now I've heard some conspiracy theories and these are just opinions. Some people think that it's region based, that there might be some people in specific regions that Amazon's looking at like, oh, this is where bad actors are. So we're going to heavily scrutinize this stuff and it trips any type of triggers. We're going to block it again. That's not facts. Those are just opinions that are kind of flying out there. So I can't say whether or not that's true. Yeah, and I'm sure in typical Amazon fashion, they're saying very little about why they did it. Um, right. They're just sending you that generic email that says you've been blocked. And it's <laughs> yes. too bad. So sad. <laughs> and listen, I, I've said this before. I get why they do that, right? Like if they tell yeah. you why they do things, then people find ways around those things. And I, I totally get it. But from the end user perspective, that is infuriatingly frustrating. <laughs> like it's just unbelievable because because they're not infallible they do make mistakes but oh, the yeah. fact that you can never really argue with them you can never because first of all you don't know the reasons but there's nobody you can ever talk to they, they always shut you down before you even get started i mean maybe at a certain level you have a, a set a special phone number there used to be that you know uh jeff at amazon.com thing that yeah. email and that would be no longer good support. you're right i mean you could, <laughs> but like now it's uh, i don't know it's it's tough to um to argue with amazon so yeah you don't want to get them get that blocked you get that, uh, that opportunity i would recommend like email support guys i just think that they're, they're trying they're trying but i think all of its boilerplate responses like they're given multiple yeah. choices or something and they're selecting like oh well this is the closest that comes to answering their specific question or concern so i think it's a lot of boilerplate type things when it comes to email support if you ever have the opportunity get on their phone support yeah you got to jump through a couple hoops and they technically call you but you go into that contact us you go in there fill out all the form type information there is the phone support it is limited hours and limited regions as well but also live chat support can sometimes be pretty helpful email uh forget about it you just uh i just rather drive my head through a wall i, I hate to say that uh, you know because i i know that they're probably trying to do their best over there but that email support system needs an entire overhaul it's just ridiculous to the nth degree yeah now, I had two things that I just wanted to throw in there that I thought were interesting. Um, 
uh, Craig, I've got a. I think your theory about them wanting to be able to instantly differentiate between what's been generated by AI and what hasn't is very true, because there are a number of big major court cases brewing at the moment with OpenAI and stuff, uh, where they're saying, "Hey, the models that you use to generate your stuff were used uh, by grabbing stuff that you didn't have the rights to, therefore." Mm every single thing generated using your ai platform is uh infringement of intellectual property and therefore it needs to be removed and there might even be a class action suit where if you generated anything that was posted online that chat gpt or another thing used and scraped as a large language model you will receive compensation and it's like I think that's one of the cases where Amazon's like, oh my God, we are going to be in big trouble if this court case happens. And therefore we need to just be able to scrub every single AI. And, and this is a big thing looming that I'm not sure people are fully aware of, but I mean, something like open AI could get shut down tomorrow and have to begin again because of the way they've created what they've created at the moment. And the other thing, which is a bit of a conspiracy theory of my own, if you've ever looked at what ChatGPT or, or other AI things have generated, have you ever noticed weird spaces? Like sometimes there'll be odd double spaces here and there. And I've got a theory in the back of my mind that what's happening is some of these uh, these uh, artificial intelligence things are inserting specific markers in their text that you wouldn't necessarily notice in unless you went through word by word. And therefore, in the future, they'll be able to say, hey, we can look because every 140th um, word that starts with a Q is going to have two spaces after it. And that way we know that it was generated by AI. And there are markers in AI generated content right now that we are not even aware of that people will be able to use to identify in the future. That's a conspiracy theory of mine, but it's a pretty good one. I, I don't think that's too far off. I, I think you're yeah. you're probably onto something there for sure. There's there's a lot of that speculation that's going around the indie author community and and more importantly to a lot of the folks that are in the anti-AI portion of things, because they are more about like here's what's going to happen i would rather be better safe than sorry over here not using it you know even there's that extreme where some people don't even want to use it for being more efficient so for instance you know not even using it for writing not even using it for any of that stuff it could probably just be simple things of like let me use ai to find out what what's a better word for this you know yeah. uh you know i'll just go ahead and use google instead because at least i won't get in trouble with something like that so it's it's understandable and if open ai ends, ends up getting shut down and they got to start from scratch i think they'll still do pretty well i think it sucks that they had trained their llms on you know copyrighted content that they did not have a permission to i think it sucks that right there i'm just going to come out and say i did not like it initially when i heard that but i'm like well the damage is done what do we do now like how do we move forward to me i'm not part of the court cases i'm not part of that system and such i would rather them to go ahead and sort that out in the meantime i would like to figure out what's the best way i can leverage this ethically how can i be able to get it to where it makes me a more efficient writer and publisher because it there's a lot of different systems uh, let me give you a good example of like how much it helps me in my business um i've got a community tab over on youtube and every week I sit down and this was, gosh, probably since May, I started putting together daily posts and it was taking me about 45 minutes to do a week's worth of posts. And this is two channels. So I was doing about an hour and a half. Now, about a couple of weeks ago, I took all of the stuff that I did that was doing very successfully over on the community tab that was drawing in more attention. And I gave it over to artificial intelligence said, okay, I want these types of themes all throughout each one of them. These are the posts that have done really well. This is the stuff that I've created already. Could you be able to duplicate something like this? And the nice thing is it cut me down from doing an hour half of work down to 10 minutes, literally 10 minutes. And here's the thing is it creates engagement and a lot of people really enjoy it. And I actually, to be honest with you, I enjoy it too. I like to go in and vote for different things. Like there's polls and there's quizzes and there's yeah. even like six or fewer words writing prompts that I go ahead and put in there. So there is so much to be said. And I hope that there's some authors out there that will at least consider just small aspects of their business. It could be something as simple as having artificial intelligence help you out with your schedule. And the, yeah. it doesn't always have to be about writing the entire book. Right. And that way it's very different to spell check. <clears throat> 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, you can use it for that. But I mean, what I find is like, so data analysis, like you said, is, is really key, right? And what authors can do, um, you know, when you send out, a, a lot of these authors have newsletters and they send out stuff to their to the readers. Sometimes they ask some questions and typically, you know, if you have a lot of readers and you're asking and you're doing a poll, it's it's a lot easier if you can give pre canned responses, right? Because otherwise, it's harder to analyze what everyone says if you have a free form answer, right? So often you're. It, but the problem with the with the pre canned responses is you're 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 um, you're limiting people to what you thought would be the answers. So um, so typically, like in the past, when I have sent out an email or something, I usually have a few of those reforms, but then you get this, you know, a thousand people respond and all of a sudden you have all this, all these different things. And a lot of them are saying kind of the same thing, but it's like just going through it is, is just hours and hours of tedious work. You just feed that into, into AI and say, summarize this. What are the key things that people are asking for? What are the key things that, that these comments are talking about? And it, does it and it does it in seconds and it, and it breaks it down so that you don't have to give pre canned responses anymore. You can still get a great summary very, very quickly now. And I think that that's the kind of thing that authors can use it for, um, you know, as well in terms of just the research side of it. Yeah. So, man, I didn't um, expect I, us to talk about AI this whole time. I had a few other things. I, <laughs> I just noticed that the time, uh, the the clock. So I guess we have to to start thinking about wrapping this up because we've reached the almost the top of the hour. But what a, it's been a really fun, engaging conversation. So Craig, do you have any final questions for for Dale? I mean, listen, I, there's so many things that we could talk about, uh, yeah. and I think we're definitely going to want to have you on again. Um, so yeah <laughs> again i didn't expect to talk about ai that was not my intention um i know that i sometimes talk too much probably for a lot of authors too much about ai so uh so you know my idea here was to have dale on and talk about key things that are happening and and, and quite honestly ai is still one of the key things that's happening in our industry and so it's still important to talk about it even if you don't agree with it yeah. that doesn't mean that it's that it doesn't exist right so we have to be able to look at this um you know with with our eyes wide open so that we know what's coming we know what our options are we know you know how to deal with things as they come and um so that's why you know discussions like this i think are important because you know it doesn't it doesn't matter which side of the fence you 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 sit on you have to just know what's happening you know knowledge is power so um i appreciate you bringing that up i hadn't actually seen that survey until you had sent it to me um so i think that that i think i actually got uh because i am part of draft to digital i think they sent me that uh, like i that triggered uh, i think I, there was an email saying hey fill out the survey and i didn't never got to it um so i appreciate that you sent that because it is very interesting and it's not surprising to me the results but um but yeah it, it is very very uh, uh interesting that they did that and and i um, i love that they're asking those questions even if most people and a lot of people don't like that they're even asking the question right yeah how dare you ask me <laughs> yeah but thanks well, for coming on i know Dale. we it's we could have talked for another hour so Dale, very quickly where can people find out more about uh dale l roberts what he does where he is you can find me over on YouTube. You can just look up Dale L. Roberts. Uh, you can look up Self Publishing with Dale or even go to self publishing with Dale.com. Again, that's self publishing with Dale.com. And you'll get all the information of where I'm at, what I'm doing, because I'm fairly ubiquitous in this business. <laughs> well, we will pop a link right down to, to one of those down in the description box. So while you were listening to this or watching it on YouTube, why don't you scroll down there? Check out that link. Go and check out everything that Dell has to offer. And while you're there, you will scroll past this big empty comment box. And I think you should definitely leave a comment for Dale telling him uh, how much you appreciated everything you shared with us today or yell at Craig about AI. Do that. that that's always a good thing. Yeah. Leave a comment. <laughs> um, hit that like button uh and uh if you haven't already make sure you hit that subscribe button and there's even a little bell icon I, a bell icon you can hit that and every week when we have a new episode of fully booked you will receive a notification and of course we will be back next week thank you very much dale and thank you everyone for joining us we'll see you next time <laughs>